Welcome to our gathering at Hope Church. We're honored that you're joining us today. At Hope Church, we exist to connect people to live the life of a Jesus follower in Las Vegas, the West, and the world. We hope you enjoy the service. been marked by something that may have happened in our lives. What do, you, what do I mean by the phrase marked by? Well, it's whenever something greatly affects or alters the way we act or behave for the rest of our lives. Jeff, what, what do you mean? Well, that a person can mark us, right? Different people in our lives can mark us. Maybe a significant other, maybe a spouse. They can mark us, they can alter or affect the way we act for the rest of our lives. An achievement can mark us. Maybe you finished a a marathon and that was a great achievement for you, a goal that you had set. Or maybe you landed your dream job, the one that you always wanted growing up and now you have that. Or maybe it's the memory of your team or group winning a, a championship that you worked so hard to fight together. Maybe an award has marked you. Maybe you were recognized by your peers or you were recognized um, by people at work um, for your hard work. Or maybe a special memory marked you. Maybe it was Sunday afternoons that you spent um, over at your grandparents' house. And that marked you. That affected you. Maybe it was the birth of your children. That affected you. For me, I've been marked by many things. My, the first thing that marked me was my relationship with God through Jesus. It affected or altered the way I act or behave for the rest of my life. Another thing that affected me was my wife. For over 25 years, we've been married, and my wife has affected me. She has altered the, me in a good way. Having two children, that'll mark you, right? Parents in the room, woo, kids will mark you. They'll mark you. And uh, it changes you. And uh, I'll never forget when, when my little girl, our oldest, was born, and she came out, and I was like, oh, my goodness, I have a responsibility now to keep this child alive, you know? like, um, And then, you know, the first few months, it's just feeding and sleeping and all of those kind of things for the child, not for the parent. We didn't sleep much. But then from there, it's like I remember when they were toddlers, I felt like all I was doing was running around behind them trying to save their life. You know, don't don't touch the plug. Don't reach up on the hot stove, right? I mean, I'm always trying to save their life. These things mark us, though. Have you ever been marked? Hopefully you're thinking about some of those things that happened in your life that were so significant, they marked you, they changed you, they affected you. We believe here at Hope that as Jesus followers, there are things in our relationship with God that should mark us. So let me ask you this question. It's a question we ask in our Discovering Hope class every time, but as we talk about being marked, let me ask you this question. What does a faithful follower of Jesus even look like? In today's culture, we tend to define a Jesus follower in one of two ways. Either by what a person does, asking this question, am I doing the right things for God? This perspective describes a Jesus follower as someone who goes to church and reads the Bible and prays and gives tithes and offerings and witnesses to other people and goes on mission trips and the list goes on and on and on. Sometimes we define a Jesus follower as by what a person does. Another way we define a Jesus follower is by what a person may know. Do I have all the right answers about God? Do I know all the right answers about him? This perspective describes a Jesus follower that is someone who has completed a series of Bible classes or they can answer a set of theological questions with pristine accuracy. 
The problem is, is that both of those descriptions of a Jesus follower, what they do or what they know, fall very short of the essence of the life of a Jesus follower as we seek a relationship with God. Here at Hope, we believe it's our responsibility before the Lord to lead you faithfully to follow Jesus. That's what making disciples is all about. But how? Well, as we look at Jesus' life in the Gospels, we see that Jesus was all about relationships. He was all about relationships. The first relationship he has was Jesus' relationship with God the Father. Matthew 4, he's in the wilderness seeking the Father. Mark 1, he wakes up before dawn seeking the Father. Matthew 3, as he's coming up out of being baptized, God says, this is my son. Jesus' life was out of the overflow of intimacy with the Father. The second relationship that Jesus has is his relationship with his disciples and his followers. We see that all throughout the Gospels. John 1, Jesus calling his disciples to follow me. Luke 9, he feeds the 5,000 with his disciples. Mark 4, he's walking on the, on, on the, on the sea during a storm. The disciples are afraid, but he assures them to not fear. He invests into his followers, to his disciples. The third relationship that Jesus has, not only does he have a relationship with God the Father, not only does he have a relationship with his disciples, but he has a relationship with those who don't know God at all. Jesus 3, Jesus in his uh, conversation with Nicodemus, Mark 5, he takes a demon-possessed man in the tombs and he frees him of this demon. John 4, he meets a Samaritan woman at the well that didn't know anything about him. Luke 19, he meets this little guy named Zacchaeus, this tax collector, and he goes to his party and he ministers to people who don't know him at all. So understanding that Jesus' life is all about relationships, relationships with the Father, relationships with other believers, relationships with people who don't know him at all, Understanding that, let's ask this question, where does Jesus now live? Well, if you have a relationship with God through Jesus, he lives in you, in me. And the goal of the Christian life is not me living for Jesus, but it's allowing him to live his life in and through me. So what his life looked like then, what do you think it's going to look like in and through you and me? Well... It looks like relationships. So at Hope, we use three key words to summarize following Jesus. You'll see them in the lobby. Abide. Abide in Christ personally and daily. It's a relationship with God. If you miss this one, you miss it all. Following Jesus is first and foremost about having a relationship with God. Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. And so many people miss this target. They've substituted religion for relationship. Christianity is not just reading the Bible and praying and going to church and giving and trying to do good things. No, Christianity is about a love relationship with God. All the other activities we do, they only make sense in the context of the relationship that we have. Second relationship that we have here that we try to help you understand and have here is to connect. So abide in Jesus daily to, number two, connect in community, in large group, in small group. It's having a relationship with God's family. Because I have a relationship with God, I now have a relationship with God's family. Some of you who are married understand that, right? You didn't just marry her. You married her family, right? You didn't just marry him. You married his family, right? When you begin a relationship with God, you belong to his family. My love relationship with God is intended to be lived out in the context of community with other believers. And as a Jesus follower, we now belong to a family. So we abide in him personally. We connect in community, in large group, in small group. And number three, we share in the mission locally and globally. It's a relationship with those who do not yet know God. 
I would say, Pastor, okay, I was with you with Abide. <laughs> I was with you with Connect. But, hey, this share thing, not too excited about that. I mean, isn't this share thing reserved for the Navy SEALs of Christianity? Right? I mean, isn't that for you, Pastor? Maybe the staff? No. The mission is not reserved for the elite of the local church. Because there is no elite in the local church. mission comes out of the overflow of our relationship with Jesus. The mission is not what we do to simply pass the time. The mission is why we were born. So we believe here at Hope Henderson that if you abide in Christ daily, connect in community with other believers, and share in his mission locally and globally, then you will live the life that God has created for you to live. You will live the mission that we have stated on our lobby wall out there, that we exist to connect people, to live the life of a Jesus follower, to have a relationship with God. So why are we opening the whole thing with this Life Mark series? Well, we're going to see that these life marks are evidences that exist in our lives as relational Jesus followers that should affect us. And each year, for the next several years, we're going to kick off the new year by looking at different life marks of a Jesus follower. We're going to look at a life mark that shows evidence of how we are abiding in Christ. We're going to look at a life mark that shows evidence of how we are connecting with one another. We're going to look at a life mark that shows evidence of how we are sharing in his mission. And as we continue today, we're going to look at this first life mark of 2024. It's a life mark that we're going to focus on throughout the year to help us to continue to focus on having this abiding relationship between you and your God. First life mark that we're talking about today is the word, the Bible. And more importantly, what we think about the Bible. When you hear God's word, when you hear the Bible, what do you think of? A.W. Tozer says it this way, the Bible is not an end in itself, but a means to bring people to an intimate and satisfying knowledge of God that they may enter into him, that they may delight in his presence. They may taste and know the inner sweetness of the very God himself in the core and center of their hearts. That's the word. That's what this is. So let's look at how the word, the Bible, should mark us as Jesus followers. If you're not a Jesus follower today, we're going to be able to explain why the word marks Jesus followers. If you are a Jesus follower today, hopefully you can say amen to the next points that are coming up. The first point is Jesus followers trust the Bible. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says all scripture is inspired or breathed by God. And profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate equipped for every good work. This won't be the only time you see this verse. We're going to be camping in these two verses as we move through this message. But why do Jesus followers trust the Bible? If you're a skeptic today, lean in. This is why. A, it's the most reliable collection of ancient writings. There are many people who say that the Bible cannot be trusted because it's not a reliable historical source. Well, let me explain some things to you. There are two things that historians, that scholars, both Christian and secular, look for to determine the accuracy of ancient writings. The number of existing copies and the time gap between the copies and the original writing of that. So, for example, Plato author and work of Plato, has 210 existing copies. When we grew to find Plato's work, there was a 1,300-year time gap between when Plato originally wrote it 
And when we began to discover the first copies, Plato helped lay the foundations of natural philosophy and science and Western philosophy. His natural philosophy is said to be a precursor for sciences such as physics. That's what we know from Plato. Or what about the author work of Julius Caesar? We have 251 existing copies of Julius Caesar, but the time gap between the copy and the original writing is 950 years. Julius Caesar, the primary historical source for the Gaelic Wars. Caesar's commentaries on his Gaelic Wars provide us with the most detailed surviving eyewitness account of a military campaign from antiquity. Homer's Iliad. 1,800 plus copies of, hundred, uh, of Homer's Iliad. The time gap is 400 years. Homer's Iliad, not counting the New Testament, possesses the greatest amount of manuscript testimony in the entire range of Greek and Latin literature. So we're looking at the number of existing copies, the time gap between the copies and the original writing. Now let's look at the New Testament. 24,000 existing copies. Time gap is only 50 years. We have 5,838 complete New Testament Greek manuscripts. We have 66,362, including Old Testament manuscripts. The New Testament is the most documented source of antiquity. And if we cannot accept the Bible as accurate, then we need to throw out all the other books. See what we're saying here? So, we know that it's the most reliable collection of ancient writings. That's why we trust the Bible. What's another way we trust the Bible? It's historically accurate. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible records for us hundreds of real historical events, names, dates, places. Did you know there have been over 23,000 archaeological digs related to the historical events recorded in the Bible, and not one event has ever had to be changed in the text of Scripture? William F. Albright, a famous archaeologist, says it this way, Archaeology is a vast subject today, having specialized faculties, institutions, textbooks, and specialized journals all around the world. In the last century, rationalist critics were of the general opinion that with the growth of this subject, the Bible would be disproved and rejected eventually. But just the opposite has happened. Things disputed by the critics have turned out to be the way they were described in the Bible. The Bible history was confirmed like no other ancient book in the world. Also, there have been many cases when the wrong notions of the archaeologists were corrected by the Bible. This is at least one, there is at least one case in which a non-Christian archaeologist became a Christian when he saw the amazing accuracy of the Bible. Why else do we trust the Bible? See, it was written down by eyewitnesses. What we have recorded for us in the Bible, all of the New Testament, most of the Old Testament is largely the writings of eyewitnesses. These are not stories and fables passed down from generation to generation. My wife and I are crime drama watchers for television. Our favorite ones are Bones, Castle, The Mentalist. Those are our favorite ones. We watch a lot of other ones, but those are our favorites. But you know what happens in these crime dramas? When an eyewitness steps up and they give their testimony that they saw it happen, there may still be a crime, but the drama disappears. Because the eyewitnesses are credible. And these eyewitnesses that wrote God's word, that were inspired, breathed through them to write God's word are credible. 1 John, the, the, the disciple John says it this way, 1 John 1, verse 1. He says, we proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes. We touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. This one who is life itself was revealed to us, and we have seen him. And we now testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. 
We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship, our relationship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. These eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses writing these words. D, it comes from God. We see that in 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is inspired by God. That word inspired is a compound word meaning God breathed. The understanding of the early church was that the Spirit of God rested on and in the prophets and the apostles and spoke through them. And that their words did not come from them themselves, but from the very mouth of God. They spoke and wrote in relationship with the Holy Spirit. And God used these men to write the Bible, their personality, their style, but the Holy Spirit was the author Peter, one of the other disciples of Jesus, another one of them, 2 Peter 1, he says it this way, Above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own interpretation or from human initiative. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. Is there any evidence that the Bible is a book from God? Yeah, You want more? Okay. The way it was written. There is something unique about the way the Bible was written. Every other book that claims to be a book from God has something in common. They were all written by one author at one time. Islam, the Quran, written by one author, Muhammad. Mormonism, the Book of Mormon, written by one author, Joseph Smith. Buddhism, the Pali Canon, written by one author, Buddha. The Bible was written as 66 books in three languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, spanning three continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe, with over 40 different authors, most of whom never met over a span of 1,500 years. Josh McDowell said it this way, the Bible was written over a period of about 1,500 years in various places stretching all the way from Babylon to Rome. The human authors included over 40 persons from various stations of life. Kings, peasants, poets, herdsmen, fishermen, scientists, farmers, priests, pastors, tent makers, and governors. It was written in a wilderness, a dungeon, inside palaces and prisons, on lowly islands and in military battles. Yet it speaks with agreement and reliability on hundreds of controversial subjects. Yet it tells one story from beginning to end. God's salvation of man through Jesus Christ. No person could have possibly conceived of or written such a work. Josh McDowell discovered that after a thousand hours of research to refute Christianity. And he became a believer. Is there any evidence the Bible is a book from God? Yes, the way it was written. And here's another one. What was written in it? The Bible is filled with stories of amazing supernatural events, but none more convincing than the prophecies in the Old Testament about the Messiah, the person of Jesus Christ. There are 50 plus prophecies in the Old Testament that foretold specifics concerning the life of Jesus. These prophecies, for the most part, were things totally out of the control of the one they spoke of. And they were recorded from 200 to 1,500 years before the birth of Jesus. And Jesus did not just fill some of those prophecies or even most of those prophecies. His life was the fulfillment of every one of those Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah. What are the odds of Jesus fulfilling just eight Of the prophecies about him in the Old Testament, the odds are one out of 100 quadrillion. Or one followed by 17 zeros. Mathematician Peter Stoner in the book Science Speaks verified that that is a mathematical impossibility. But Jesus did that. How do you explain it? Because all scripture is God breathed. That's why Jesus followers trust the Bible. 
He said, give me more, give me more. Okay, all right. Jesus followers, not only do we trust the Bible, we believe that all scripture is inspired or breathed by God. Meaning, number two, Jesus followers hear God through the Bible. The Bible is alive. You ever been there? Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between joint or soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. It's alive. Martin Luther says it this way, the Bible is alive. It speaks to me. It has feet. It runs after me. It has hands. It lays hold on me. Mark Batterson said, when you open your Bible... God opens his mouth. You ever been there? Open up this old ancient book and all of a sudden there's a verse that jumps off the page and slaps you in the face. You're like, what is happening? It's alive. Not only is the Bible alive, but B, the Bible tells us about God's love for us. My life verse, my favorite verse in all of the Bible, 1 John 4, 9 and 10 says this, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us, or literally he first loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sin. That's the Bible. It shares his love from him to you, to me. It's personal. It's alive, active, living, breathing, sharper than any two-edged sword. And it communicates his passionate love for every person on this planet. It's a message. In Genesis, man sinned. We became separated from having a right relationship with God. And then from Genesis 3 to Revelation, the Bible addresses God's plan to love us and to bring us back into a having a right relationship with him. So Jesus followers trust the Bible. Jesus followers hear God speak through the Bible. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. The third thing, the last thing that Jesus followers, we are affected by the Bible. It should affect us. It marks us. It's profitable for teaching It gives reproof, it corrects us, it trains us in how to be in right standing with him. It equips us for every good work. It also adjusts the way I view God. It adjusts the way you view God. Because it's his love letter from him to us. It's not just a book of rules. It's God's way of allowing us to see how he loves us, allowing us to know how he desires to protect us and how he desires to walk with us in relationship with him. It adjusts the way I view God. He's not this powerful, uh, all-powerful person who's not personal and that's going to strike us with a bolt of lightning if we do something wrong. No, he's a God who has never-ending love, never-ending faithfulness, and desires a relationship with us, even though he knows we're sinners, to extend grace and mercy and forgiveness to us. That's the God we serve. That's the God of the Bible, him desiring relationship with humanity. It adjusts the way we view God. It also adjusts the way I view myself. There's some of us who walk around saying, I'm a good person. I never killed anybody. I can live this life. I'm a decent boss of my own life, my family. The Bible adjusts the way we view ourselves. His word tells me who I am. That I'm a sinner. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of God's standing. 
But it also says, there's still hope for me to have salvation. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So it may say that we're a sinner, but it also gives us an answer for being sinners. And that's a relationship with him through Jesus. It says that I can be saved by grace in Ephesians 2. That we are saved by grace. That we're saved by faith. Not by works. So that any man can boast that his grace, by his grace, we are saved. And when we are saved from our sins... Galatians 3 says that I was bought with a price. I was bought with the blood of Jesus. You know what that means? I belong to him. It adjusts the way we view ourselves. You are now, if you've entered into a relationship with God, you are his child, 2 Corinthians 6. You are an heir of his, says Romans 8, and on and on and on. The Bible says, adjust the way we view ourselves, adjust the way we view God, adjust the way we view ourselves, and finally to adjust the way we view the world. Gives me a biblical worldview. I begin to see the world through the lenses of the Bible. So when I look at the world and I see the pain and the suffering and the confusion and the darkness and I, I see the loss and but I also see the joys and the celebrations and but then I see the work and the labor and when I see all the things I see that through the lenses of the Bible and God teaches me his plan for all of these things everything this world has to offer I begin to see through the lenses of his word when I'm in his word and when I know his word this is the foundation we should set our lives on all scripture is inspired by God it is profitable and valuable 2 Timothy 3 16 his word teaches 2 Timothy 3.16. It reproves and convicts 2 Timothy 3.16. The Bible fixes our faults and trains us as in the rearing of a child, 2 Timothy 3.16. The Bible is alive and active, Hebrews 4.12. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, and his word penetrates our lives and judges the thoughts and attitudes of our hearts. His word guides us as a lamp into our feet and a light into our path, says Psalm 119. The Bible helps us live lives of purity in Psalm 119. Luke 11 says that we are blessed to be able to hear his word. Isaiah says that his word endures forever. The Bible is flawless, says the psalmist in Psalm 18. And those who are wise will build their lives on it, Matthew 7, 24. His word is eternal, Matthew 24, 35. And it gives understanding to the simple, says Psalm 119. The Bible is right and true. His word is our salvation in John 1 and 1 Peter 2. And it gives knowledge and understanding to our lives, says Proverbs 2, 6. His word is truth, and his truth sets us free, says John chapter 8. His word humbles us, says Deuteronomy 8. You can put all of your hope in his word, says Psalm 119. His word is powerful. It does not return empty and achieves the purpose for which it was sent, says Isaiah 55. We can abide in his word. Word, says John 15. We can hide his word in our hearts so that we might not sin against him, says Psalm 119. And all of his word is true and eternal. You can put your hope in his word, says Psalm 130. His word is perfect, says Psalm 19. His word refreshes our soul, says Psalm 19. We can treasure his word more than food itself, says Job 23. His word is our source of life, says John 4. His word is our refuge, says Psalm 119. Jesus followers. We can trust the Bible. We can trust the Bible. We can believe, Jesus followers, we believe that his word speaks to us. And it affects us. It should affect us. In our abiding relationship with God, his word 
should mark us for lifelong. So what does this look like practically? Like what are the action steps here? Well, I think the first thing is to encourage you to have a daily time with God. Maybe it's on the Bible app, on your phone, or maybe it's a reading plan that you start. But man, there's no better way than the first month of the, of the year to begin to get in the Word. To allow the word to mark you as a Jesus follower. The other thing that this looks like practically is not just daily time in the word, but weekly time under the word. Can I just tell you this? I'm going to say this in a minute, but I'm going to tell you early. Hey, we're going to teach the Bible here. And every week when you walk in this room, just know this. When you leave here, you will have been taught God's word. So daily time in his word, but also weekly time under his word. What does that mean? That you come ready to hear what God has to say to you through the word every single week. So daily time in the word, weekly time under the word, and then consistent fellowship around the word. Get in a small group. If you're a teenager, go to student ministry. If you're a kid, go to our kids' ministry. We are around the word. Here at Hope Henderson, we're going to be doing several things all year long around the word in our different ministries. And I just want you to see it. Preschool. For ages two-year-old to kinder, spend time every class. This is what they do over there. When you're in here, this is what they do over there. You say, I don't have a preschooler. I don't care. I'm going to let you know what they're doing over there, right? They spend time every class reading their Bible story and flipping through their Bibles, growing in their love for the Word. That's what we want to teach them. They memorize a new verse from the Bible every month. They've been doing that for years. And they practice knowing God's Word in their heads and in their hearts. Two years old is when we start this. Parents get a copy of Raising Passionate Jesus Followers at Parent-Child Dedication to learn how to apply God's Word in their parenting. For our kids, our elementary ministry, they do verse memorization tools for their kids every single month. They're memorizing verses as well. They do SOAP Bible challenges, which is a fun way to help them understand God's Word and where they can find certain books of the Bible in the Word. They emphasize bringing Bibles to church and they teach on stage from the Bible and less from the screens. More family uh, they want to do take-home tools for God time, family prayer. Our elementary, wanna, they provide every single week take-home tools for you to, to have some awesome times together as parents and kids around God's word. Family table talk, conversation guides given to families. So that's our elementary, our students, our teenagers, our 6th through 12th graders. The goal they have this year is five students, not adults, five teenagers, Begin discipling at least one other student in 2024. They emphasize bringing Bibles to church as well. Emphasize coming to church, not just to Wednesday night from 6.30 to 8.30, but to church on Sundays. Students receive a Bible when they begin a relationship with Jesus. And Joey teaches from God's word every single week. For connection, our small groups and our care, we are providing church-wide guided Bible studies for small groups and promoting support, disciples making disciples. We're doing a gospel conversations training on Saturday, this coming up Saturday, that's going to be grounded in God's Word and what God's Word tells us about telling others about Jesus. We're providing uh, training go teams. These are our mission teams that go out uh, locally and globally. And we're training them and equipping them to be able to share God's Word. With our worship ministry, we're centering our song services around what's being taught from the Word of God week to week in our gather times. If you're really astute, if you listen to some of the words of the song, you can figure out what we're going to preach on before I even start preaching. That's what Corbin and the team do. Church-wide, we're encouraging everyone to start each day in the Word and to use a hear journal. 
These are available for free for you um, in the, uh, at the Welcome Center right outside. Um, here stands for highlight, explain, apply, and respond. So basically you take God's word and you write it down. What's my Bible verse and what's the date and what, what's highlighted? What jumped off the page? Just write down what verse that was and what it was about and, and then examine it. Ask yourself, why, why, was, why was this written and, and, and what, what's the author trying to say? You're examining it and then you're applying it. Writing these things down, like how can I apply this to my life? And what is my response? What's my prayer? What's my action? We'd love for you to be able to use this as a tool or resource. You can pick these up for free at the Welcome Center. We're encouraging you to do that all year long. Um, The other thing that's going to be new that we're going to do, starting with our next sermon series, is providing a verse that we're going to seek to memorize together as a church for each of our sermon series. Now, we're not talking about each week, right? But our sermon series are sometimes three weeks, four weeks, six weeks long. And we're going to provide one verse during those four or six weeks for us to memorize together as a church. And we'll have a fun way of doing that. Don't worry, you won't be called up here on the spot. And like, what's the memory verse, right? So, And of course, as I've already said, each week we will always have a message from the Bible. So as we respond today and the worship team comes up, we're going to end a a little differently than we normally do. If you're visiting with us, we normally have a time um, where we have some some of our prayer team up here. And during the response song, we want to give an opportunity for you to respond to what God's saying to you. But this is um, one of those moments where, you know, you just may just need to sit and and kind of be in it for a minute. And so we have a song that we just want to sing over you this morning. Um, And then after the service, me and a couple of others will be up here during, uh, as you dismiss, um, if you need prayer or anything um, after this song. But what we want to do right now is just really give you the opportunity to just kind of sit and think about what you've heard today. God's word is alive and active. And as Jesus followers, his word should mark our lives, not just on Sunday, but on Monday morning and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday, being in his word. So we just want to sing this song over you as you just kind of sit. And some of you can sit and just listen. You can close your eyes and just listen to it. Or maybe you just want the words will be on the screen. You just want to just sit and just look at the words as they sing this song over us. Maybe you want to stand and sing. Maybe you know this song. I don't know. I don't think anybody does. But if you do, maybe you just want to stand and sing. It's like everybody else is going to be sitting down. Who cares? It's you and God. But let's get our hearts around his word and around what he has to say to us in this moment. So Holy Spirit, we love you. We thank you for your ministry. We thank you for what you want to do. We thank you for what you're going to do. And we thank you for how you minister to us every day. And God, I pray that you would minister to us right now with this song. God, that we would be led by the truth of your word. And God, that you would lead us out of here on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday to be people of your word, to be Jesus followers marked by your word, the Bible. So lead us now. We pray these things in your name.